Thank you, Dr. Subramaniam, for that wonderful keynote. Um, we now move on to the round table, which is to be moderated by Mr. Uttal Singh Bhatia. Welcome to the round table discussion. Uh, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam has already laid down the entire ground that we wish to cover in this round table. We expected him to make a very stimulating presentation. He has done much more than that. He has stimulated us and I think also provoked us. Uh, and I hope that my panelists are sufficiently provoked. Uh, we have five very eminent panelists. I will not embarrass them by elaborating on their credentials. Uh, I will confine myself to, to reading out the rules of engagement. I will call upon each of them to speak for seven minutes. And there is a, a, a nice young lady here, nice but firm, who will, who, who will tell you when your five minutes are up and when your seven minutes are up. And after the initial presentations, we will have about 20 minutes for an interaction with the audience. And after that, uh, each of the panelists will have an opportunity for the last word for two minutes each. I, I, I have to, uh, I mean, forgo my seven and a half. Okay. So, so we'll leave that for Q&A. Yeah? Okay. So uh, uh, I, will, I, will, I will call upon uh, the panelists from left to right so that they can be adequately prepared. So Professor Gregory Shack. Thank you for the preparation. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Bakke, for inviting me and to the WTO Secretariat, the organizers. It's great to be back in India with many friends. So I thought I'd do my, the thesis for my talk will be very similar to what we just heard, slightly different. And that is that what we see in terms of the challenges of multilateralism today is a convergence of two interrelated forces. One is captured by the descriptions of new trade theory and the second unbundling of what we can also call hyperglobalization. And, and that, that, under that theory, and one can see that multilateralism actually isn't necessary. If it's built on building rules for global supply chains, they can be involve a nexus of bilateral contracts, bilateral treaties, it can involve regional trade agreements like the TPP and so forth. Of course, what's happened at the same time, the new, what is often referred to as new trade theory, as opposed to old trade theory, we have development of what can be viewed as old trade politics. And that is returned economic nationalism, the dark forces of protectionism. And those both beset, uh, they offer, offer potential, but they both uh, engage the, the dreams of multilateralism with severe challenges. So, under new trade theory, I'd nonetheless argue that WTO remains an important backdrop, but a backdrop is part of an overall ecology of trade lawmaking, rulemaking through many different organizations, institutions, with actors uh, interacting within these various spheres. And so just as you could see statutes are the engine of change within national jurisdictions, where statutory change occurs within the framework of a national constitution, so the WTO could be viewed as a constitution for global trade within which trade rules are developed often through bilaterals and through FTAs. People speak about how the WTO rules are so out of date today um, and that for global supply chains you need new investment protection, you need competition rules, you need free flow of capital, transparency, services liberalization regulatory cooperation, and so forth, which negotiations are taking place in the WTO. The WTO appellate body, though, under this, uh, this scenario, remains incredibly important, as Chad Bone and others have pointed out, that as tariffs decrease, forces of protectionism remain. They, the, the vehicles that are used are at the center of WTO rules, such as import relief, anti-dumping, countervailing and duty, as well as standards. Uh, phytosanitary standards and technical barriers to trade. So the WTO appellate body remains quite central. Now, of course, some of the appellate body jurisprudence, as we know, has upset many in Washington, particularly with respect to constraints placed on import relief law, uh, rules. 
um, and practices in Washington, D.C., my country. And so you could see the strategy of President Obama and, uh, was really, as he said, quote, the U.S. should write the rules for global trade. And the way that the, the strategy was to write them through the TPP, to write them through TTIP, and one could imagine a counterfactual where this is very much a return to a club model of, uh, of rulemaking, just as the old GATT and the WTO. But now that the WTO has seen a democratization of participation in the making of trade rules, the US and Europe have worked, returned to the club model in this way. And had the US been successful in concluding both a TTP and a TTIP, one could imagine those being merged and the US withdrawing from the WTO just as it withdrew from the GATT in 1995 when the WTO was created. And suddenly there'd be incredible pressure on the rest of the world once more to join a organization, a multilateral one now, but where they did not participate in writing the rules and would have to exceed under very tough negotiations. And I believe that was overall the, the US strategy. In terms of history, it's, it's nothing new. The best way to view multilateralism, in my view, then, is an overall ecology. The WTO is part of an ecology of trade rulemaking, which includes bilaterals and regionals. On the opposite, we can view this optimistically and pessimistically. On the optimistic side, um, the WTO still plays an important role in integrating this ecology, including the appellate body. Um, I wrote a recent article with uh, Alan Winters, which will show up very shortly in the World Trade uh, Report. A world Trade Review regarding the fragmentation of trade law and the role of the appellate body in the Peru additional duties cases. How can we view the WTO appellate body as an integrating force with this, this welter of rulemaking? But on a pessimistic side, I'd say that we, are, we do risk moving back toward darker times um, of economic nationalism and old trade politics that the phenomenon described by new trade theory has helped to unleash. There is, of course, of a historic precedent for this in the 1930s after the US did not join the League of Nations. That was a world where economic relations were not grounded in law and governance through an international institution with a third party dispute settlement mechanism. It is not a time we wish to repeat. Thank you. Professor Thomas Scottier. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for um, allowing WTI to participate uh, in this very important conference, which perhaps um, should be termed uh, WTO at 22. Because there has been these fundamental shifts uh, in the meantime, uh, since 20 years were celebrated, and uh, we perhaps are not yet in a position to know whether we're going back to the 1930s, whether we'll see another smooth holy act, whether we'll see a slump of world trade, uh, whether we we'll see a world of retaliations. Um, my point is, I, I'm an optimist and I believe this is not going to happen because the world is not the same as in the 1930s. The markets are much more integrated through to globalization most of the trade, as we learn from economists, is uh, trading components which go back and forth here. Um, but there is another element, I think, which is very important to note, and that's the regulatory nature uh, which is at the forefront of today. When you follow the political discussions, uh, you get the impression tariffs are the most important. It's about renegotiating NAFTA because the tariffs are wrong, the rules of origin are wrong. Um, I think the people who are dealing with trade policy will learn very soon that these are not the real issues today. In a highly integrated world economy, uh, it's about regulatory convergence. It's about the question to what extent should we harmonize rules as we have done that in the TRIPS field. Uh, many years ago, uh, whether we should uh, work with equivalence or whether we should work with mutual recognition. And these, of course, trigger uh, questions about democracy and inclusiveness, etc. Now, the first attempts to approach uh, these questions, of course, have been done uh, within the European Union, which came a very long way. 
and uh, outside of regional integration it was tried essentially with TTIP and we don't know whether TTIP will go ahead. TPP was less advanced on regulatory convergence but the problems will not go away. So if TTIP is, uh, is not uh, flourishing and the model will not succeed, uh, this is yet another reason why the file should be taken up by the WTO. But the WTO, that's my point, is badly prepared for this. Apart from the TRIPS agreement, we really have not really engaged in regulatory convergence. Um, in services, there were some attempts, but um, it hasn't come much out of it here. And the question will be whether uh, a universal organization is in a position to do so. In order to answer the question, one has to go through the learning process. And so my urge is to uh, schedule the WTO work in a way we did in the run-up to the Uruguay round, where you had a very long learning process. You had meetings, you had seminars, you had uh, discussions of an academic nature, just to understand the problem. And this is something perhaps which uh, the WTO might go back to in preparing for these issues of regulatory convergence and combining um, questions with uh, self-determination, inclusiveness, uh, democracy and, and, and um, linking this uh, to, to what we call the multi-layered governance. I also think that um, the way we negotiate uh, if we want to take up the chances have to be reviewed. I'll take climate change. The, the, the normal answer you get is, well, let the people uh, in UNEP work it out and they'll pick, run with it what they come, we'll adjust the WTO accordingly. I don't think this is good enough because most of the instruments which are needed to implement climate change policies will be trade policies and these trade policies have to be developed within the WTO, just about things like PPM and transfer technology. I take the example of energy. Um, we have um, a need to prepare for regulatory convergence in electricity, electric, electricity flows, we cannot uh, bring about a world of renewable energy without interfacing different uh, regulatory systems here, and that should be done in the WTO. We have a huge problem with fossil fuel subsidies, about, um, uh, I think it's about um, 60 billions or annually, uh, which should be phased out and gradually reduced and replaced by other types of social policy. And these are things which uh, should be taken up. And when you look at the structure of these problems, they are all complicated, entailing goods, services, investment, intellectual property issues. And we cannot address them in the classical compartments of the WTO, where you have people dealing with trade and goods, services and intellectual property. These are things which need to be integrated. So my point is, uh, yes, I think there is a chance to uh, come back to the multilateral forum, use uh, the universal authority of the organization, but the organization has to rethink the way it works uh, in preparing for these uh, new issues, which uh, people will soon learn that they are at the heart of the matter rather than um, tariffs and rules of origin uh, by which they try to uh, improve uh, conditions. Um, these traditional policies will not be able to address the increasing problem of inequality which we face in the West and which triggers all this opposition here. We need proactive policies to overcome uh, this and to bring about equality back home in our own societies. The question will be, what is the contribution of trade policy? I leave this as a question mark. Thank you. Dr. Harshwardhan Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jan, and thank you to the organizers. Uh, the question uh, we are addressing is, is there space for trade multilateralism? And after the deep and insightful uh, keynote speech by Arvind and some very valid points made, uh, I must say that there is a lot of scope for repetition, including the point that there is a scope for multilateralism, but my answer to the question is yes and no. Uh, 
and I don't say this as an economist, so I'm not being a two-handed economist. Yes, but not in the way we know it. How will multilateral effort in WTO, because when I say multilateralism, the multilateral trading system is the WTO. You can actually have multilateral effort in some areas, be it fishery subsidies, be it e-commerce. You, you can have plurilaterals with MFN. I mean, those are the kind of things which you can conduct within the WTO. It was interesting, you referred to climate change. A very important feature of the Paris Agreement was that it didn't bind the countries legally. So can you have an agreement which is aspirational and then you go on and bind incrementally? I mean, the, so you have to find new ways of doing things. Similarly, uh, there will be progress in the rules area. Uh, you talked about regulatory co uh, uh, convergence. Actually, I think convergence is going to go the same route as TTIP. Because what we need is regulatory coherence or mechanisms where there are mutual recognition agreements, etc. It's If I take one area where convergence is really required, say the plugs which are used in electrical equipment, you, my uh, uh, example is to use an adapter so that when you're in another country, have an adapter which fits into the other plug. So it's that middle part which needs to be brought in through regulatory coherence. Similarly, transparency kind of agreements. We will, in the new ways of doing things, have to look at transition periods and flexibilities. Even the TPP, which now is no longer taken as seriously by its key proponent, actually had huge transition periods, 30 years. The kind of uh, flexibilities they had, safeguards during the period of that transition. And if you see some of the policies which are being discussed in the US today, there's a lot of transition, even with border tax adjustment, etc. People are, uh, are considering those kind of things, plus flexibilities. Similarly, in the multilateral system, you can have facilitation-oriented agreements. I think that has a greater possibility of uh, coming to an agreement. And I just feel, uh, I mentioned some of those areas like regulatory coherence, etc., that though TPP is not in vogue, there are a number of areas in TPP which actually provide a large basis of looking at them and trying to take them to the multilateral forum. We will have, to, however, in the WTO, not only change the manner or the framework in which negotiations is done, we will have to show much more sensitivity to the gap between the rich and poor, the vulnerability aspects, something which was added on in the trade facilitation agreement, for example. And why is that so? I'll just comment when I come to know. Uh, why I feel multilateralism will continue is because both the movement in investment and technology will leave no choice but to have some kind of an agreement. In a world where internet is moving in such a way that you don't even have, the regulator cannot control part of the chain and regulate, the regulation is needed even in the first transaction, without regulatory coherence and collaboration, you cannot manage the issue. The whole system is going to change. Suppose you visualize a, a 3D printing and M2M communication, where something is happening in, say, Philippines, the M2M communication sends the signal and design to Japan, and suppose Japan and US have an FTA, and, and there is, I have a few minutes from Arvind also. <laughs> so, and, and the, the, the machine, the 3D printer prints it, your rules of origin, I mean, 
This is the father of the global value chain in killing the rules of origin and killing the whole basis of an FTA. So we need to, it will make you sit at the table and make new rules, but that will take some time. But before that, a number of different ways will have to be found. In, in the no part, the current US administration is looking at bilaterals. I mean, that's not something which leads to multilateralism. It takes the world away from them. It's not something which addresses vulnerability. It's something which actually enhances it because you are being very selective and you are only doing FTAs with those whose markets you are interested in and get, trying to get the maximum out of them. The impact of policies which are being currently discussed and followed in the US, I think will have, uh, we, they still need to, uh, we need to see how they play out, but the way they are being proposed does not show great potential towards multilateralism. Then, if you really need multilateralism and you don't want to go for uh, plurilateral with uh, MFN, you actually need consensus in the WTO. You need to change MFN for that. If you want to go towards the, the path which some of us have been thinking about. And you won't get it because there won't be consensus for it. So it's a chicken and egg kind of problem and we have to get a solution for that. Success of the EU-Canada uh, trade agreement, which we got news about today, will, will I think focus people on, on other kind of RTAs. So I don't think the era of RTAs is dead. There, there are models which will come up. And several important issues because if consensus is not reached on certain issues, several important issues will be dealt with outside the WTO. The other thing which I, I fear is that now it's not like the 1930s where when you were trade protectionist, you actually impose tariffs. Now we are getting into an era of informal trade barriers. Just a statement by Mr. Trump that he's going to impose X tariff on somebody led to certain kind of actions. The, we are going back in some way to the voluntary export restraint era. And that does not cater well for WTO or multilateralism. So there is a balance. We all, as Arvind said right in the end, I think the countries which have a lot to lose, growth potentials, depend a, uh, in a major way on how trade grows. And the middle income countries, definitely, if they want to move towards the high income countries, are in that position. And they have to then make the effort to find all those flexibilities and areas where we can move in multilateral. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I must at the outset thank Arvind for having uh, laid the ground so very uh, completely. Actually, in a sense, I, uh, my feeling is that this whole conversation about multilateralism, as you did point out, is a pretty old one. There was a time when we, in the big early days, when uh, the difficulties of actually meeting with the disciplines, meeting with the uh, challenges and the expectations of liberalization was an enormous strain on developing countries. And actually, it was at that point that within these countries, the rationale for multilateralism, globalization, etc. was challenged and questioned. And now it's the original liberalizers who, who question. And I think that uh, when you look at, say, Brexit or the kind of discourse we heard out of the US election, uh, these are just milestones on that pushback, which has been a fair continuum. But I think also it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, simplistic, and if I may say, a shortcut to really meeting with the real challenge, and to some extent that's been flagged already, and that's that multilateralism uh, in no way will remove the disparity between nations entirely. 
or within the nations. So that is always going to be a challenge and that is an aspect on which nations will have to address that aspect themselves. Within your economy there are going to be responsibilities, there are going to be decisions that you will have to take uh, if when you, when you are part of a multilateral uh, forum or a framework that uh, you are able to do it in a manner that is inclusive, that does not lead to the same kind of mistakes uh, that other countries have had to endure. So I think that uh, as we go on this path, this is, this is a sensitivity and a calibration that every country, when we, when we talk about uh, middle income countries and their responsibility to take this forward, I think that we will temper it with the responsibility to make sure that whatever we do is inclusive and does not enhance disparities within our own countries. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I think that uh, even this entire multilateral experiment has never been a linear thing as such. We've always made experiments with bilateral agreements, the regional agreements. These have always muddied the waters. These have always been efforts to shortcut uh, what seemed to be taking very long uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the global forums. So I think we have to see that this uh, has happened. The other reasons that we have had to question perhaps the credibility of uh, multilateral uh, institution has been somehow the, if I may use a strong word, the hypocrisy which has informed process at many points of time. Um, where the standards that you had to live up to or the coherence, regulatory coherence that you had to aspire to was a coherence or a regulation developed in an environment which was very uh, aspirational for many developing countries. So I think that that uh, also is uh, something that has been a challenge in the past. Um, and the the fact of it has been that it has not always led to an opening up of markets uh, because in fact the sophistication of non-tariff barriers, particularly in uh, some of the economies, has actually defeated the objectives of multilateralism in many ways. And uh, I, I will only speak for uh, India, but certainly we face those challenges and have faced and will continue to face those challenges uh, in actually getting real market access uh, for goods and services. And when we talk about services and the growth of services, I think we have to also factor in the increasing sophistication uh, of the barriers to real access uh, that all countries are doing. Uh, and this is not the protectionism that uh, is just part of the discourse. Uh, the protectionism that exists by much greater use of trade remedies, much greater uh, use of tariff barriers and import taxes. But I think the, uh, the complexity and sophistication of the regulation, which is very, very difficult for even a middle income country to aspire to, so when we talk about this exp the entire effort, I think the coherence that must come will need to come at a level that is accessible. And this, this is a difficult middle ground that uh, we will need to work towards. I think also that um, as we talk about the middle income countries, what struck me was the absence of China there. Uh, huh? Pardon? It was I know that, I know that, <laughs> and so I flag it. <laughs> the, we cannot actually conceptualize or plan a way forward by ignoring uh, a, one of the strongest players on the global platform today. And uh, a recognition of China's aspirations and China's plans uh, is essential if we are to make the entire effort towards multilateralism succeed. The, and I think uh, you cannot brush that under the carpet. And as we talk about the, the large uh, 
plurilateral agreements, the uh, regional agreements, and the TTIPs and the TTPs, I, I note that we rarely talk about the RCEP, which is a similar form, uh, formation, but it's, and it's moving. It's, the reason we talk less about it is because it tempers its ambitions to, to meet the capacities of all its members. But in a sense, it has a certain strength and it has a certain logic that seems to be moving um, in a direction that may perhaps lay the ground uh, for newer engagements of a similar nature. So I think that uh, we need to watch very carefully where that agreement goes. And many of the middle income countries in Arvind's presentations are all actually in the RCEP and members of the RCEP. So the way they choose to frame their discourse amongst each other is going to reflect in the way the discourse will reflect uh, at the WTO. So I think uh, those really are the issues that I'd like to flag. Um, um, having said, I'll give up. I just want to say one thing. Um, it's provoked by something that uh, Thomas Cotier said. Um, he said, uh, uh, Thomas said, uh, you know, uh, the, f uh, the WTO needs to learn how to kind of do regulatory convergence or in Hush's words, regulatory coherence. I see this slightly differently. My interpretation of all that's happened is a pushback against deeper forms of integration. Uh, and, and regulatory convergence is, 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 of course, that. And I'll give you several examples. You know, In the case of the UK, migration was a big issue. Uh, it's a deep form of integration. Uh, they also chafe at the fact that the ECJ should decide their fate. Within Europe, I think the common currency, which is one form of integration, is in, is in kind of uh, uh, under stress. In the, in, the, in, in the TPP and TTIP, things like investor state disputes, et cetera, were also not some things that people you know, could easily converge on. Uh, and so that's why I, I think the way I interpret what Harsh is saying is that I think that the move back to the WTO is in fact possible because of a move away from the, 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 the backlash against globalization is in some ways a backlash against deeper forms of integration. And, and, and so it's true that the WTO needs to evolve away from just doing tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why the kinds of things that Harsh said, I think, are you know, the kind of uh, balance. But I think the point strongly is that you know, uh, the WTO is becoming relevant more because deeper forms of integration, which the WTO couldn't do, you're right. Uh, but then it's becoming, you know, uh, people are pushing back against deeper forms of integration. Yeah, and RCEP is another uh, good example. So, uh, so, so I, I just wanted to make that, that point. Thank you. Uh, I think we've heard some very interesting ideas. And before I, I, I open the floor for discussions, uh, let me uh, make a few very brief comments of my understandings of the very rich uh, ideas that have been uh, floated. I think in a, in a sense, the question that we are asking ourselves, is there space for trade multilateralism, is a pretty nonsensical question. Because whether we like it or not, globalization has created an unprecedented amount of <laughs> interdependence within the world, which requires certain global uh, governance mechanisms. I think the, the more relevant question is, in the way the WTO is presently configured, can it play the central role in trade multilateralism? And when I talk about configuration, I think there are two aspects of it. One is the processes and the other is the vision or the mandate. As far as processes are concerned, of course, the central issue is the decision-making 
processes that, that are built into the WTO agreement. Uh, in, for instance, uh, the, the requirement of consensus. Or even if there are agreements among the willing in terms of plurilateral arrangements, the, the need to extend those uh, arrangements to, uh, on an MFN basis and so on. So there are a number of issues uh, which the WTO would need to discuss in terms of the processes that uh, under, underlie its negotiations. As far as the, the, the mandate or the vision is concerned, I think it is important with due respect to distinguish the WTO from say the UNCTAD. The WTO is not an, a forum for open-ended debates. It is a forum for negotiating legally binding agreements. And therefore, the ecosystem which, which sort of pervades that, the, 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 the dynamics of these discussions and negotiations are necessarily very, very different from the, the kind of discussions, for instance, as Hush pointed out, uh, through the Paris Agreement. Uh, uh, th there is a difference between aspirational agreements and legally binding agreements. And, 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 and therefore, uh, the, the conclusions to that are, are obvious. Regarding the, the, the vision or the mandate, I think the WTO also needs to look at its, its, its uh, basic ethos. The basic ethos it, it inherited from the GATT was a mercantilist ethos. Now, uh, in, in, in an area, in an era where there are there are rebellions against deep integration, there are global issues regarding equalities, there are global concerns regarding other non-trade issues like climate change, food security, public health, and so on. I, I think the, the, the WTO also needs to revisit its, its, its guiding ethos, uh, but. Let me not go on about this. Uh, I would now open the floor for uh, discussions, uh, for comments, or for questions, uh, with one request that when you do ask, make, uh, you wish to make a point, please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Arvind, for an excellent uh, presentation. and. Uh, this rich uh, collection of ideas. Um, this is very interesting and it raises two questions. One is about the what the WTO would do and the other is about the how it would do it. And the what, I, I would start with the question uh, regarding the point that was made by Thomas Cotier, that we are, the bulk of what we negotiate now is really about behind the border measures. It's less and less about, uh, uh, about border measures. Uh, which means that it's all about regulatory issues. And this would require a certain degree of uh, cooperation in all areas today. It will impose itself on us, whether it's about data flows, whether it's about taxation, whether it's about uh, qualification requirements, or whether it's about movement of natural persons, responsibilities of sending countries uh, versus receiving countries. So this is the nature of the new frontier of trade negotiations. Now, the how we do it. What we have negotiated, actually, in the system over the past 70 years, surprisingly, most of it was plurilateral. Most of it was plurilateral, i.e., a subset of the membership would negotiate a deal, apply it on MFN basis. Right? The only two exceptions for that were the establishment of the WTO and the Trade Facilitation Agreement. Now, looking at the system and what it is today, I see what Arvind was saying, and I completely agree, 100%. What the WTO is facing now is a leadership deficit uh, caused by the withdrawal of the classical leader, which uh, poses the question, we need a new leadership formula, which can only be a, a coalition kind of, uh, of leadership. My question here is, why can't we see the way of the future in the WTO in the form of plurilateral, critical mass-based projects that would be um, bearing fruits that would apply on MFN basis? And by the way, if we 
agree that the bulk of the agenda is going to be regulatory issues, surprise, surprise, most of those uh, outcomes are going to be applied MFN anyway. Most of what's in the TPP would be applied MFN if it is applied. But that actually makes the discussion of the free rider risk a much simpler discussion. Can we see the way forward along those lines? And if so, how would we best assemble that coalition of willing and capable? That's the question. One last question also for Arvind about the differences between trade and goods and trade and services with respect to India. Uh, because you, you, you posed the question, would the expansion of services trade face similar consequences? And I asked the question myself, I'm a lawyer by training, nobody's perfect, but from an economist's point of view, if we, if we see that services actually covers two-thirds of global FDI today, and trade and services defined to in, in, incorporate factor mobility, Shouldn't we be looking at different consequences for services opening and services liberalization, which would lead to results that are qualitatively different from liberalization of manufacturers? I apologize for the length of the questions. Thank you. Any other request for the floor? Yes, Madhu. Yeah, to, I'll address my question to Dr. Subramanian. On the EU issue of convergence, I was wondering what the contrafactual is. You know, if the EU had not been there, would have been, would there have been greater convergence? If the EU is disbanded today, would there be greater convergence among those economies? And in some senses, are we sort of destined to learn a lesson the hard way? If you look at the entire, uh, you know, approach to uh, protectionism today, the entire disenchantment with greater integration and whether that applies even to the kind of thinking we are seeing from the US, Brexit, are we destined in some ways to learn our lessons a very hard way? Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Fred Abbott. In, in response to some very thought-provoking comments, I'd like to make a thought-provoking comment that really came to me as I was listening to the discussion. Part of what we need to capture, or should be captured, is that what is going on today is really driven by populism and anti-intellectualism. And it isn't at all surprising that a group of intellectuals who have been involved with the WTO for the past, well, since it was created and before, would come to the conclusion that there's room to reinvigorate the WTO per Arvid or per Thomas regulatory convergence. But if I were the chairperson of General Electric or Siemens or Boeing or Lockheed or uh, Tata Motors, I might begin to wonder whether I really want to rely on government and government policymakers at all if the government policymakers have in fact been captured by anti-intellectualism and populism, and that maybe our best course, if I'm these chair people, is to in fact set up alternative forums where the private sector is really negotiating these regulatory convergence rules and its own set of arbitration systems to mediate intercorporate conflicts, and for that matter, a tendency towards cartelization of global markets as agreements are reached. So I realize that's kind of a radical thought in response to what has been said. But in light of what's currently going on, I, I, I wonder if there aren't, in fact, even other approaches that might be explored as, this, as we try to wait out the current policy environment. Thank you. Thank you. That reminds me of Jack Ma's proposal that the regulation uh, regarding e-commerce should be negotiated between the firms themselves. Uh, uh, can you take one more question and then uh, the panelists will respond? Yes, 